joining us this, this I guess this afternoon, uh, for our webinar, the Illinois Parent Attorney Network webinar on the uh, DCFS child welfare transformation. Um, so we wanted to get started. Um, we, I think we're going to have a very full uh, agenda uh, to discuss the uh, DCFS plan. It's a five-year plan, a strategic plan, and it is um, a, a work in progress very clearly. Um, I can report um, that uh, both the Illinois Parent Attorney Network and the Family Defense Center and possibly other groups that are uh, represented here on our call uh, did do significant comments on the initial proposal that DCFS put out for their five-year strategic plan. Uh, we did extensive comments, um, uh, and I'm very pleased to report that I reviewed the uh, strategic plan that they developed, um, and there were many changes, and some of them very positive ones, that I think we can already take some credit for. So I think we're going to be talking about those specifics today um, and trying to get a uh, sense um, of where we can uh, continue to advocate, where some of the continuing gaps are in the DCFS plan. And there is a very big gap. I can just um, sound a theme that I think we're going to be hearing uh, you know, from all of our panelists today, uh, that there is much work to be done to, by DCFS to recognize the importance of parents. Uh, in the lives of children and in the way they do business. So uh, with that, our plan is to have um, those who attended, uh, a, a few of the people who attended the two-day summit uh, speak to what the program was so that everyone on the phone uh, call and on the webinar can hear what the significant takeaways were from the two-day summit. Um, and uh, that will start with Sarah Block uh, and then Sarah Galoon. Uh, and then we would ask, uh, and then I will talk about the second day. And I would ask uh, both Suzanne Sellers and Jessica Breyer, who were there, to add um, as to the, the sessions that they attended um, that we did not. So we will have a, a very full sense from uh, our presentation now for those of you who weren't able to make it, what the significant points were that DCFS was trying to communicate to an audience of about 600 to 800 people uh, in very star-studded uh, panel of people that were presenting, 170 presenters, actually, they said they had at this summit. So with that, let me turn it over to Sarah Block uh, to talk about the first day presentation. Great, thank you. Is my sound okay? Diane, can you hear me? We can hear. I don't Okay, there are great. People on the I'm, webinar. Okay. That's right. I'm missing it. I assume that everyone else can hear too. Wonderful. Thank you. Um so I attended the the sign on the Oh. Are you hearing an echo? Yes. We just oh. did, but not now. Okay. So let's see if it continues. Um to be okay. I attended the summit on the first day. Um, and I echo what Diane said about the importance that the summit felt. So um, DCFS tried very hard to make this summit feel very important. Um, I think they actually said there were over 900 people who registered. Um, the room was packed. There was not a seat to be had. Um, and it's an inaugural summit. The idea is that the summit will happen every year. Um, it's something that Director Sheldon did in Florida, and he told me I had some face time with him during the summit. And he said that he had over 3,000 people come to one of the summits um, as they progress. So this is going to be a regular occurrence. It, it is a, it, that's his intent. So it began with a very official military flag ceremony. Um, and then George Sheldon gave the opening. And I think the most critical thing that he said during his opening, which echoes what he's been, he, he said um, over the past year in town hall meetings and such regarding the transformation plan, he said, um, that DCFS should be a should move from a family police agency to a family strengthening agency. So you've heard him say that before. Um, as Diane said, 
um, one of the questions is how do you do that without the investment in parents and the partnership with parents that we see as a dearth in the transformation plan, but at least the words are there. Um, then Governor Rauner spoke um, and he shared an experience he had in which um, he met with a group of, of um, foster youth and they said to him that we want to be called, we don't want to be called words of the state, we want to be called youth in care. And this was, he said this was one of the most moving experiences of his life. It brought him to tears. And at that moment, he said, great, they're going to be called youth in care. Um, so he, that was sort of I, the takeaway from what he said. Uh, but what was clear is that there is this sort of um, almost like an old boys club feeling now between the governor and director Sheldon. And we'll talk, I'll talk a little bit more about how the other directors of other social service um, government agencies are playing into that too. But there's sort of the sense that DCFS is now a part of Illinois social services as a whole very publicly. Obviously before Director Sheldon that was still the case, but there's just sort of this partnership and this camaraderie that you're sensing between Governor Rauner and, and George Sheldon. Um, after Governor Rauner spoke, um, a man named Rafael Lopez spoke. He is the um, federal commissioner on the administration of children, youth, and families. Um, he gave an, a very powerful um, explanation for the stat of the status of child welfare in um, the United States and, and in Illinois. Um, his story itself is inspirational. He was the first in his family to graduate high school, college, any sort of graduate degree. And now he's an, an Obama appointee in the White House. So he's, he's a very powerful person. Uh, he said that, it, that the system as we know it is not working. He highlighted the tragic outcomes for, for many foster youth. He said that child welfare should not be a pipeline for homelessness, juvenile justice, criminal activity, but rather that foster care should be a golden ticket for youth. Um, he talked about the, the importance of prevention, and he mentioned that there's a federal bill pending called the Family First Prevention Act. Um, he highlighted the, the challenges around domestic violence, mental health, and substance abuse. Uh, and that he, would, he was quoting somebody else when he said this, but he wants a system that rather than digging for dirt, it digs for strength. Um, and so he, as I said, he was, a, he was very powerful and he had um, sort of set a tone um, that it's okay to acknowledge that the system is broken and not working and the way to fix it is to be focusing on prevention, holistic services, strength in a strength-based perspective. Um, and I'm, so I, then later over lunch, um, First Lady Diana Rauner spoke. Um, it was nice to have her presence there. I think it, um, again, showed the commitment of the state of Illinois to DCFS and the summit. Um, she didn't really say anything of substance, but her presence there, I think, was more of a, as a figurehead. Um, then over lunch, or after lunch, um, there was a presentation on the 1115 waiver. Um, some of you may have heard Director Sheldon talk about this 1115 waiver um, over the past year, but it is this large um, undertaking that um, all of the directors of um, 13 agencies in Illinois, government agencies or departments in Illinois, are getting behind. And typically, in a nutshell, what it is saying is um, Illinois has filed an application to the federal government asking for a waiver. Um, this 1115 waiver to Medicaid to allow certain Medicaid dollars to be used for services that currently they're not able to be used for. Um, and this waiver is under an overall um, desire to overhaul behavioral health in Illinois. So these 13 government departments are working together to try to integrate physical and behavioral health. Um, so this 1115 waiver, although it seems to be sort of the the talking point of this overhaul, um, it is one component of the overhaul. Um, at the summit, in discussing this 1115 waiver, um, there were other pe other directors and secretaries from different government agencies in Illinois. So there was, I'll just mention the names in case uh, you all know them. Uh, James Demas, who is the Secretary of Department of Human Services. Felicia Norwood, who is the Director of Healthcare and Family Services. Nirav Shah, who is a um, Director of the Department of Public Health, and then Director Sheldon. They so each took a component of this overhaul and discussed it. And the idea is that um, these 13 directors want people to be able to navigate behavioral health issues in a sort of a one-stop shop way. They don't want the system to be so overwhelming to people that they can't access services. 
Um, and so part of that, as I said, is the waiver. Um, and <clears throat> Dr. Sheldon highlighted the different services that would be able to be paid for for child welfare related purposes if this waiver was granted. So it would be intensive home services, respite services, supportive, ho supportive housing services, supportive employment services, and infant and early child mental health initiatives. Um, the focus is on prevention and trying to avoid people having to use the extreme um, residential facilities or hospitals that, to deal with sort of more routine mental health or behavioral health issues um, and to really build up community-based organizations and service providers as the, as the structure of, um, of mental health and behavioral health service providing. Um, they are, the, all these secretaries and directors are very confident that they will receive it um, and that the, 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 that the waiver will be granted. It may not be granted during this administration, but they've been guaranteed that it will be pushed ahead when the new administration comes in. So they are, this is a, a big component of, of this overhaul. Um, and I think sort of the, the issues around behavioral health that are happening statewide in this, in this initiative are trickling down and influencing sort of the themes of the, of the transformation plan. Um, so I guess I will, I, would ha I have some more things to share, but are, I guess maybe I'll pause and say, are there any questions about the waiver? Or am I able to ask questions, Diane and Brian? Can people ask questions? Yeah, you can. Or should I just keep going? Well, okay. if anybody has questions on the phone, on um, the webinar, they can type them in. Oh, great. Okay. You know what? I'm logging over through my phone. So, Brian, will you alert me if there are any questions? I will. Okay, I'm sorry thanks. to interrupt. So I'll keep. Oops, sorry to interrupt. It's Colleen Daly. I just wanted to let you guys know I'm on the phone for when you guys need me. Okay. Great. Thanks, Colleen. Great. So I'll I'll keep going on um, in the interest of time. Um, so there was also a mega session, which was there were two mega sessions, so people were split in. Um, Sarah will talk about the other mega session, but I attended the one on immersion site. So you may, if you've read the strategic plan or if you've heard other things been talked about, immersion sites are sort of this new initiative that Dr. Sheldon is really pushing. Um, his, he brought someone from Florida named Pete Degre, who is in charge of the immersion sites. I've met with him directly. Um, and there was a presentation on what immersion sites will be. I will mention that um, the summit was actually a three-day summit on Monday. I think it might have been invite only, um, but there was about 200 people who attended to discuss immersion sites for the entire day. None of us came to that session, we were, um, but we went to this breakout session where we heard an hour about immersion sites. Um, I will say that it's still somewhat unclear about what immersion sites are and how they were function, but I think we glean a little bit more about their purpose. So there will be four locations of emergent sites right now, starting within the next month, rolling out. Um, the four directors of those emergent sites were introduced at the breakout session. And they are hoping to roll out um, four more within the next nine months. So the idea with these, these emergent sites is it is giving more autonomy to investigators and, and, and the supervisors there to really meet the needs of the family, in theory. That would be sort of a deeper involvement a more coordinated response um, using community-based organizations to help with services and a more holistic approach. Um, one of the bread and butters of these emergent sites are going to be child and family team meetings. Um, there was a video shown about how what child and family team meetings are and the impact that they can have, the positive that ostensibly that they can have on families. Um, they seem to be more focused on involvement in juvenile court, in cases are juvenile court involved. Um, and Sarah, Sarah, can I just yes. interrupt right there? And um, yes. because we were actually approached, Jessica and I, uh, by Lisa Spagapan, who is the general counsel to DCFS, as we were outside um, on the second day. And I'm just bringing this up because this is, you know, something that directly affects by our network. Um, they are very concerned about. Um, uh, having parent attorneys involved and parent representation, um, and this is a real gap uh, in their ability to carry out some of these goals. Um, and so mm -hmm. um, we need to put that on our agenda for how we're going to hope to address that as well. But the immersion sites, as I understand it, are Lake County um, 
East St. Louis and at, um, somewhere like Mount yeah. Vernon. And what's the other one? Does anyone I, know? I have it written down. Let me pull it up. Um, St. Clair. Okay. St. Clair. Um, yes, and I was going to, Diane, thank you for raising that point. In discussing, in the discussion that followed the presentation on emotion sites, that was one of the issues that was raised. Um, and especially um, in terms of if a GAL feels that they can't come because the parent attorney can't be there, um, in terms of how they can talk to the client and, and um, the importance of having attorneys there for parents to actually make them effective. Family, child and family team meetings because obviously um, it's a change of how things have been done in a way. Um, they've, been, they've been occurring in some contexts, but not all, all contexts, and maybe they're not haven't been, been um, conducted in a way that's best in accordance with best practice. Um, and so there's supposed to be an opportunity for parents to say, this is what my goals for my family are, and this is what I need help with to try to help achieve these goals. Um, now, we all can highlight many reasons why getting to that point may not happen as effectively as, as they hope, um, but the, that is the idea. So having an advocate or an attorney present is recognized to be a critical element of success for the me these meetings. They're not saying it's required, but we all know how important it can be. One of the other main concerns with emergency. Just oh, before we go move to that topic, I'm sorry, it's Jessica Breyer. Um, so just in line with Diane discussing uh, their approach to us about getting parent attorneys involved, there was one more area that's very similar to uh, child and family team meetings. I mean, different venue, but the ACRs where mm -hmm. I, I had a conversation with uh, Diane Cottrell, who's the de Deputy Director of the Division of Permanency, and she oversees ACR as well. Uh, we used to get notification of those as parent attorneys. We do not, but the GAL does now, and we don't get them anymore. Um, and so we also had a conversation about how parent attorneys could get uh, notice of the ACRs, which was really the substance of the conversation with the general counsel about child and family team meetings. So I think those are two areas of even simply starting off by getting notice of those meetings that uh, are going to be helpful to us. Yes, thank you for raising that. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other concerns that has been circulating quite a bit is that when Director Sheldon and Pete G. Gray talk about immersion sites, they both say that we we want to stop being so rule driven or bound by rules and procedures. They have not. I, I that raises a lot of red flags to all of us um, because we sort of think to ourselves, well, they think they've been bound by rules and following the rules. Now, what are they going to do when they're told they don't have to? Um, it was raised as a concern by someone in the audience, um, and I think it's unclear as to what that actually means. Um, but I think it's a point to keep on our radar screens and is, and is, is potentially concerning um, as how it's going to play out. Um, the last thing I'll say about the immersion sites is that um, all of the immersion sites are being evaluated um, by um, this man named Dr. Richard Epstein from Shape and Hall, so they are very outcome focused, which is a, which is consistent with some of the goals of the strategic of the transformation plan. Um, and so there is this ongoing of um, outcome measures and evaluation from the immersion site. Um, did, it's, did they um, talk about what was being measured? They did not yet. Um, the session that I had that I attended with Dr. Richard Epstein. It was not focused on how they're actually measuring the immersion sites, but he did make a very interesting point. He said that Director Sheldon is sort of putting a lot of other initiatives into these immersion sites. So it's going to be somewhat hard from a research perspective to evaluate the effectiveness of the immersion site when you have all these other variables. Um, so we and I and I honestly don't even know if if at this point DCFS has a clear it, it has, it's as clear about what they're measuring. I think that research model is still being tweaked um, until they really launch. Um, but I think it's an. I think it will be helpful to find out what those outcomes are. But as I said, the the, the, the doctor Epstein, who's doing the, the data collection, um, I think sort of realizes that there are a lot of um, a lot of classification, a lot of variables that need to be taken into account to actually evaluate the effectiveness. Um, so the last thing that I'll say is that I, went, I attended a technology breakout session, um, and 
Um, Illinois as a whole is trying to improve its technology. Um, again, there are representatives who are working with, um, with the governor in improving technology across the board in Illinois. They made a point that they are trying to move technology from the past 45 years forward in the next four years, starting from 2015 and 2019. They're trying, to, they're, they're trying to cover 45 years of progress in the next four years. Um, one thing that was important is that there's going to be data sharing among these 13 agencies. Um, and DCFS is now using mobile devices. Um, they've rolled out about 1,000 mobile devices, and they're trying to help um, to in the moment, moment be able to enter notes and or, for example, use if they're trying to find a placement for a child after corrective custody is taken, um, they can access the database from all of these different agencies and maybe find a placement for the child with family. So they're trying to use more real-time um, mobile devices and, and technology. And they're going to do geographical mapping also for kids um, um, and for service providing and things like that. So it seems like there's a push for um, technology improvement. So my, my overall takeaway from the day that I attended is that Jeffrey Sheldon wants to change business as we know it. He wants people to trust DCFS. He wants people to um, see them as a, a source of strength in their lives rather than, than a hindrance. Um, he's focusing on prevention, coordination, and holistic approaches, behavioral health as an emphasis, and the strength-based um, model of practice. But the key thing is how is this going to actually play out in real life, especially when the parent voice seems to be um, drastically missing. So, so I will now turn it over to Sarah was going to um, add in, um, and then we would ask Suzanne and, and Jessica to mention any other first day uh, workshops that you attended where you had significant like information that you want to share. Great. This is Sarah Galuna, the Family Defense Center. I just want to add a few brief thoughts in addition to Sarah's about day one. I agree that the rhetoric was definitely there in terms of what they're saying is strength-based approach to families. It's still a concern, though, how that is going to translate into um, actually, you know, recognizing the voice of the parents. One example is they are very big and excited about this change in, you know, words have meaning and, and no longer referring to foster youth as foster kids or wards, but youth in care. Um, we see it as a big concern. They're still constantly referencing birth parents instead of parents, and, you know, we'd like to see that change. Um, one panel that I attended, and Jessica was there as well, was addressing barriers to, barriers to prompt permanency for kids in the courts, and right away it was a glaring example of the missing voice of parents. Um, the panel was a judge, a this Diane Cottrell in, in the permanency division, a GAL, a state's attorney, and a DCFS attorney in juvenile court. Jessica was there in the audience with me, but they'd invited every single person who works in juvenile court except for a public defender or parent's attorney. And while they all said in permanency, you know, of course it's return home or remain home as the ultimate goals, but in, in their anecdotes and in their own uh, perceived barriers, it all seemed to focus on permanency in, in other forms and not necessarily returning home, with the exception of services as a big barrier when there's delays in, in getting services for parents. So, you know, that's a concern, and I think it showed in that panel um, regarding um, the voice of parents missing to some extent. The I'll just say one brief point about the other mega session that I attended, which didn't really merit a mega session, but it was um, the governor and the director are very proud of the um, recent bill passed establishing normalcy, which um, simply allows foster parents to make decisions based on a reasonable and prudent parent standard. So before they would have had to get apparently various layers of consent for simple after school activities, and now they no longer have to do that. So it, it didn't cover too much more ground than that, but that was a big area that they're very proud of and emphasizing. Um, very lastly, uh, by far the most interesting session I attended was um, a session summarizing and, and demonstrating what's going on with the simulation house um, that they now have in Springfield. I'm not sure if anyone's aware, but it's a new part of the training for new investigators. They still have instead of just lecture 
of what they call didactic training. They're now incorporating some simulations where they have an actual house with actors inside and the investigators being trained, go knock on the door and play out a scene and all of these things. And then the second part of the simulation is they have a mock courtroom where the investigator is trained on how to testify at the shelter care hearing. It sort of remains to be seen. Right now it's in a pilot mode. I asked whether any of their simulated cases they do end in unfounded decisions. The answer was no. They are only doing one simulated case, and it's of course a case where you know the parents are the parties are lying and the stories don't line up. I think um, the best thing that came out of the session was you know making a good connection with this head trainer who's now at Springfield. Um, University of Illinois Springfield and was previously at DCFS who said she'd be happy to share materials and kind of what they're doing. So that's good. I do see it as a concern that they're, you know, being coached and trained a certain way regarding the shelter care hearings because that's not going to be a totally, you know, objective, neutral position. Um, but it was very interesting to see that they're using these simulations, which in theory could be a good thing to train, you know, better tactics for investigators, but it's something we want to keep on our radar, especially in all of our current negotiations with DCFS to implement the safety plan settlements and make sure they're being properly trained um, with respect to the new safety plan policies. So I, I, at this point, I'd ask Jessica and Suzanne first. Um, uh, Suzanne, why don't you speak to um, any sessions you went to on the first day that we haven't talked about uh, for a minute or two? Yes. Hi. Uh -huh. Can you hear me? Yes. It it seems like it has an echo. A little bit, but I think it'll. I I'm the one echoing. Okay, put yourself on mute. Hi, I'm Suzanne Sellers, and on day one, I attended the Permanency for All with a subtitle of Family Finding and Fix of Can. I was a co-panelist on that workshop on day one, and I'm a little concerned still about the department's progress in this area. The workshop was mainly a presentation of a grant, a five year grant that they that a group of people worked on in the department. Uh the grant the the results of that uh, grant and that research don't actually say what they're going to do to affect permanency for families and it surely did not say how they would reunify families as a measure of permanency. They they talked, like Sarah Galoon mentioned, they talked a lot about permanency in other forms, but not permanency in the form of returning the children home to families. Suzanne, I have a I have a quick question um, on that on that panel. Um, did they say that they got a grant going forward, a five year grant, or is that grant finished? That grant is finished. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So they were talking about that. I just, if people want further information, I served on that steering committee team, and um, and the concept of having um, the concept of having people find families, so the the children are not uh, going to other placements. Um, other non-relative placements uh, was something that we talked about a lot. I don't know if that came through there, but it's um, it's interesting because it brings up a point I felt a lot of the conference was focused on, on um, playing to um, foster parents and, and advocates of permanency, meaning not return home kind of thing as well. But I, I also see that group as an opportunity to um, to try to move forward. I spoke with Scott and Debbie, two of the presenters, and um, somebody else, and their grant ran out. It was supposed to be enveloped in DCFS, um, but then it, it didn't work. And so we're trying to get a grant to hire somebody to do family finding for us, specifically for placements that our clients want and placements that would lead to quicker return home because there's more access to the to the um more access the parent has to the child. So um 
they so anyway so that is just how we're trying to use the work of that committee in our office to bring bring that to us thank you thank you for mentioning that i did also want to quickly mention that part of the uh, presentation at that uh, workshop was regarding the new amendment to the fictive can law that will enable the department to declare foster parents as fictive can in in 12 months time and I find that very troubling um, and and I can see I can foresee some uh, difficulties even compounded with uh, reunification of families so that's something that us we as advocates need to keep our eye on. We've but seen it first... already here. We've seen, um, we have seen a nurse at a hospital become a fictive kin to a baby when the baby was released from the hospital and therefore a foster parent over a family. So it is. Right. And that's terrible. I mean, uh, now they, they, they will be able to do it legally. That, that was legally through a different part of the fictive kin bill. So, yeah. Oh, okay. Troubling. Mm hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you for uh, mentioning that. I think we we need to keep a, 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 an eye on that. As well on the uh, first day, I attended in the evening a networking group. It was a networking group that was supposed to be about co-parenting. It was a group attended by foster parents and parents of origin. And the the gist of the group is uh, of that networking session was that uh, – there's a clear racial divide uh, in, in child welfare with regard to foster parents and, and birth parents, uh, I'm sorry, parents of origin. In the room was about 24 people, and we were in a circle and we were doing exercises uh, and someone was leading the discussion. And towards the end of the, the session, I asked the question that I asked if all of the black foster parents in the room would raise their hand and no one raised their hand and then I said will all of the white parents of origin raise their hand and again no one raised their hand and so I said I I think this is part of the problem and the room kind of exploded after that a lot of people had a lot to say uh, but what I was what I heard being said was not uh, an acknowledgement that racial disparity is is a big part of our system it is it was a big part of that room that night in that discussion and, and that's troubling so i think the department needs to address that more on the second day i attended diane's uh red uh workshop that she presented on on safety plans and my takeaway from that is it's still an us versus them uh, stance taken by the department with regard to safety plans. One uh, person had uh, uh, a comment in the audience. She said that it appears that Diane Ritleaf and other advocates are putting the rights of parents before the safety of children. And that's not true. I'm, I, I would like to see the department and, and advocates work towards a both and instead of an either or. It's not about the safety of children versus the rights of parents. It should be a, situ a scenario across the state where both children can be safe and parents' rights can be upheld. And, that, and that's the end of my presentation for right now. Jessica, do you want to add to with sessions that you attended? And then I'll talk about the second day overview. Sure. Uh, on the first day, I, as Sarah said, I, I also was with her at the Addressing Barriers to Prompt Permanency for Kids. Um, I, 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 it was a glaring, I mean, I tried to go to all the sessions where everybody else was there besides parent attorneys. And, uh, and so at the end, I just made some statements about normalcy should, uh, should take into account when we're talking about return home and we're talking about parents and and we're talking about what, you know, it's not normal for a kid to see their um, parent once a week on a return home goal. And so we talked, I just made that comment. There was a judge sitting next to me uh, who I think was a presenter in another one. He's, he's definitely an immersion site uh, judge, but he 
turned around and he thanked me for that comment and the reminder. And so it's it's just interesting. And then as afterwards, I went up and I I spoke to um, Diane Cottrell, who who really they they seem open to involvement from us. We so I I think they I I think we have an opportunity. My take is that there's a glaring absence of of parent attorneys, but that the table is going to be open to us. Um, we just have to get the time and the resources to be able to to get ourselves there. But I think that door is open. Um, the mega session that I went to that day on normalcy, I also went to that one. Uh, one of the things that struck me there is the and and throughout the conference, the director's comments about the um, child uh, network. I forget what it's called, but the the um, the DCFS is youth and youth uh, pa panel or advocacy group. Uh, the director is paying a lot of attention to them, and they actually had a very strong leader um, running uh, running one of the me mega sessions talking about normalcy. Again, it was kind of missing the normalcy about the return home process, but it struck me there that what we need to do is really uh, try to support the birth parent counselor or any other parent groups that are working within DCFS and that have the director's ear to transform them from more of a support group to more of an advocacy role. Because I think also in a conversation, I had a conversation with the director after that because I forgot my lunch and I went back in and he was there and so I talked to him and I explained who I was and how many parents we represent and I said I you know I applaud your efforts in the speak to include parents in this um, I said but we you know we we need to be at the table there's a lot of sessions where we're missing from and he said email me next week so again I feel like the door is open to have some conversation about where the parent voice is missing to people that can actually make um, make a place for our voice so that was that was encouraging um, then I went to a session that Dr. Glick um, was in and that session was let me, I'm sorry I have to go back to the exact title of that one that session was um, is that the second day that was the day that you were there, Diane, right, Dr. Glick, or no? Sure, I've got, I've got the, title. the title. We've got the title. It, it okay. was Creating Regional Unit-Based Multidisciplinary Teams to Investigate Child Abuse. Okay, yep, here we are. So uh, that, that um, in, 2000, in February of 2016, the Illinois Justice Task Force submitted some recommendations to the General Assembly entitled The Urgent Need in Illinois for Multi-Based Disciplinary Teams to Investigate Child Abuse in, in accordance with the public act that they list here. Uh, the recommendations included the creation of specialized units within regions across the state to include law enforcement, DCFS, child abuse pediatrician medical experts, and child advocacy centers, and state's attorneys. Uh, the so they had a panel with uh, Dr. Glick, uh, uh, Kim uh, Majarcino, who's a statewide multidisciplinary team coordinator from CAC, and also the executive director of CAC. Um, they have done a lot of work. Actually, right as I was going into the session, I was looking up the Illinois Children's Justice Task Force. And um, so the task force, is a legislatively mandated. Um, it's a legislatively mandated task advisory group. It's supposed to make recommendations to DCFS directed at improving investigative, administrative, and judicial handling of abuse and neglect case um, cases. The focus is on sex abuse, sex exploitation, and child fatalities, as well as duly, um, as well as um, cases combining jurisdictions. It's been around for a while. It's been around since 89. Um, and it's a, um, so it's, like I said, it's a legislatively mandated group. It represents the categories and people in the field from child protection, law enforcement, medical, mental health, attorneys for the prosecution and defense, criminal and civil court 
uh, judges, education, children with disabilities, child advocates, parent advocates are supposed to be on that panel, uh, child abuse survivors, individuals knowledgeable about children with disability and duly involved kids who are homeless. So um, I looked at the members on that task force and didn't see very many people who would fit the category of defense attorneys um, or parent advocates or civil court um, people involved in civil court. Um, the, the three that appeared to be somewhat uh, trying to fill that role were uh, James Radcliffe, who's a mediator now. He's a retired judge from Bellevue. Uh, Charles Reynard, um, who is an attorney, I believe, in Normal, Illinois. Oh, there's four. Richard Russo, who's no longer on the committee. Um, he was an attorney from Wheaton, and Stephen Sawyer, who's a retired judge, who's an attorney. Um, the two retired judges, I believe, are former prosecutors. Um, so I happen to be sitting next to Mary Dreiser, who is the um, chair of that committee, who was also on some other committees that I was on. And I said, Mary, what, you know, we, we need to be on here. Why I see that this. So she forwarded me a nomination form and um, a, can a candidate form. So I, I asked her to nominate Peter Perry, who's my boss, who is over both juvenile justice and child protection, among other things, to that committee. They meet four times a year. Um, so she is going to do that. She had just submitted uh, names to the director uh, for that committee. Uh, but she doesn't know if he's acted on them or looked on at them yet. So hopefully we'll get in before the next round of nomination comes. People are appointed to serve four-year terms, and I believe they meet quarterly. And people have to attend those meetings. So again, I think it's another opportunity to get a parent advocate on that board. Um, so if we, I think we should do that. So the parent attorney would be hopefully on the board, but the parent advocate. The reason why I think it's so important to be on that task force is because what they are coming out with is um, they want to they want to bring uh, the child abuse pediatrician models at Lori's and Peak and University of Chicago all over the state and in state in places that don't have um, large enough hospitals there they would they would combine it and have it be regional. There are some, of course, it doesn't involve, it involves prosecution, law enforcement, um, child advocacy centers, DCFS protective services, and um, she wants to call this new thing uh, peed cans, and they want to bring telemedicine into it, which is something that we've been talking about on the Shaken Baby Listserv of the new found thing of a nurse practitioner looking at a case, calling a doctor remotely, and the doctor essentially putting a stamp of approval on that. So what they are come, proposing to come out with could be potentially very dangerous unless there is some monitoring and how it's done. Um, she also discussed a lot about the, um, the barriers that child abuse pediatricians face in, in, in um, in their work and that they're having problems recruiting more child abuse pediatrician and she blamed it on um, the time away from work and getting beat up in court by attorneys and that they have to come testify so much now so um, she also it, so that was another takeaway from that um, event but I think it's really important for us to get a parent advocate as well as a parent attorney on that task force um, I also, like Suzanne, went to the Shared Parenting Network uh, event, and um, really a big takeaway I got from that was that um, well, one of it is that that both the parents and the foster parents really didn't seem to to understand the concept of institutional racism and that how how that affects um, what's going on on the ground day in day out and particularly their lives. Um, so, but what I also took away from that is that there is the group who was running it as Be Strong Families, and I can tie this into the QPI initiative later, and, and th 
I should back up. The education on institutional racism and for foster parents and birth parents is something that I can discuss later with the transformation team recommendations to the director. Um, but the the Be Strong Families um, is the organization that was running the uh, shared parenting network event, and I also see that as a they're not perfect by any means, but I see that as a an organization that we can target because they are working within DCFS right now to get, they're, they're having the conversation between, uh, they're trying to bring together parents and foster parents. And that is not, has not been a push that's been supported by the department in a, in a real structured way in a long time. And, and that also goes into, I'm going to talk about the quality parenting initiative yesterday, but I think we need to, find some strategy to piggyback on all that to continue the conversation of of connecting parents with foster parents but also in a non in a in a productive way for our clients in a non patronizing way in a non so I think we we can take advantage of some of that so that's my takeaway from day 1 um, I'm going to um, move on. Um, I just wanted for people on the on the webinar, we are way beyond the time for the description of the summit, but I have uh, I have thought that's very productive. So because there are so many takeaways, so many things that we need to know about that I have sort of deliberately not interrupted this because I think there's so much information and. Um, we did get news that Kent Dean is not able to join us. I can make my own presentation on safety plans very short. Um, and we, I do think it's important to share all this from the summit because it does set the stage for us. Um, so moving on to the second day, and I think we can go till, till 1 o'clock um, with a discussion of the second day programs and then try to, you know, to have some topics like domestic violence and the whole issue of race. Um, legal representation um, and family services that we uh, and more more on the strategic plan too. Uh, you know that we that we that we see areas that we can we can focus on. Um, I other than the um, presentation that Jessica mentioned with uh, Dr. Glick, I don't think there's a mention of investigations um, in the entire strategic the strategic plan or in the in the um, uh, program, I think our pro my session on safety plans did include a discussion of investigations, obviously, but um, other than that, I don't think DCFS has really at all integrated the idea that they're an arm of, they are a police arm and they are an investigative agency. They, they really aren't owning that. Um, maybe that's in some ways a good thing, but it's certainly a, 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 a gap. Uh, in the in the whole um, uh, acknowledgement, um, this whole transformation plan was referred to by Barbara Greenspan, who's the attorney general who represents DCFS in all the major litigation. She first referred to it as the BH plan, and I think that's telling because BH is about kids in care. It does not have any uh, uh, com really uh, representation of the interests of families. And so I think that they have been moving in a direction towards um, reflecting uh, family interests, but they're not really there. So I was going to mention on the second day, um, I did miss the first two presentations, unfortunately. I heard they were excellent, that the Department of Corrections uh, person was excellent, and the fact that they are um, you know, working cooperatively and focusing on prison visits, and they showed a, vi a powerful visit, uh, video about mothers at Logan um, that was very highly uh, regarded. Um, it seems like they are very open to expanding the support for, for, for pa parents um, who are experiencing incarceration um, and working with, you know, supporting those parents. So that, that seemed very positive. Um, they, uh, there was, uh, Doc, uh, George Sheldon gave a very long speech at the beginning. It was about 20 minutes to half an hour. Um, some of his messages were really, really good. And then there are the messages that we have concerns about that, that Sarah Block mentioned. Um, some of his messages were uh, 
that I questioned were we have the most experienced case managers in the country. I think, you know, he is really focused on sort of building up their discretion, building up their uh, ability to work flexibly, but at the same time, and he gave the example of Sully Sullenberger at the end of his talk in terms of landing the plane on the Hudson. Well, you know, I think the analogy is pretty flawed. Um, we, we do not have Sully Sullenbergers in these um, investigator and case manager positions. Um, so, but he's sort of trying to, to move in a direction where they have so much flexibility and that is a big concern. But in terms of the messages that I thought were really powerful and good, he said to ask everyone to ask, is poverty the reason for coming into care? That's very positive. They, he mentioned um, uh, the uh, need to talk to, to kids and the need to talk to the people who are affected and that language matters. I mean, the gaping hole is that they don't know how to talk about a parent. Um, they say, they, they are the home of last resort. The home goal is to, for children to have a home. A theme of one caring adult, at least for every child, is something. And then the idea of strengths-based um, work. Um, he did say that a placement disruption in the middle of the night says to a child that you don't matter. That was, I thought, a very powerful statement. Um, so and that was those were my notes on the um, morning presentation uh, in the in the plenary session on the second day. Um, I did miss half of the quality uh, parenting initiative, but I was encouraged because the person who was pre presenting on this quality parenting initiative, which is focused on uh, foster parenting, uh, building uh, and building up. Uh, their uh, communication with the biological uh, or the uh, family of origin and working together and supporting them and strengths-based. Uh, the person who is running that project for DCFS is a very uh, long-term uh, child and family advocate from the Youth Law Center who I, I spent some time talking to with Jessica after that session. Um, but Jessica, I will let you talk more about what that quality of uh, parenting initiative is. Um, my session uh, on safety plans I'll kind of hold for when we're um, going over um, uh, the, the, in, the, in the breakout on topics. Um, so the, the speeches during lunch and at the close were also very, very powerful. They had a presentation by Rodney Walker who is a phenomenon, and his presentation was unbelievable. Um, he is a kid, and it was almost devastating to, to, he, to really hear the reality of the, uh, the levels of violence, addiction, and just serious um, uh, devastation that he had grown up with. His siblings are all, I mean, in jail, um, addicted. Um, he has... Um, gotten through, uh, you know, multiple placements in foster care and gone on to um, sort of, he's now 24 and he is, has a master's degree from Yale and he's on his way to Harvard so in, to get a PhD. So he was incredibly impressive, his pow very powerful message in terms of, you know, uh, really coping with the reality of what the children and families are living through. His own mother was extremely traumatized herself. And so this theme of trauma-informed work, you know, was strongly echoed in what he was saying. Um, and without, you know, blaming his parents, but, you know, recognizing the reality of their conditions. And she was, his mother was, was raped as a, as a young child and herself became an addict. And his father, you know, was also, um, uh, addicted and there was mental illness issues too. Um, so, so, and then at the close, they had a, a, another um, presentation by another youth in care. So youth in care were definitely on display and I just feel like we need to in increase our presence, you know, so that the families, you know, so that we don't have this idea that, that children 
don't come from families and that we can look at these kids and you know um, in isolation from from the families that they're that they're from and returning to um, so I think that is Jessica do you want to fill in with the quality parent initiative and any other sessions that you went to on the second day and, and Suzanne do if you went to others Suzanne do you want to go ahead were there any other sessions Suzanne that you went to on the second day no? Okay, Jessica, why don't you go ahead on Quality Parent Initiative? Okay. Hi, no, no. I no other sessions I wanted to discuss at, at this time. Thank you. Uh so I I agree with some of Diane I well I I agree with her thoughts about uh the focus on youth and care, but I also I also I think it leads for an opportunity for us to collaborate with the youth in care instead of just being seen as different, you know, mm -hmm. our approach going forward. And again, I think one way to do that is perhaps through a, uh, engaging the um, the the equivalent of the birth parent council in DCFS, but for youth, because I think that voice, that combined voice, demonstrates exactly what we're trying to say uh, about families. But that's just that, that was just my thought coming out of out of the mm -hmm. um, as well as that was my thought coming out of some of the speeches that Diane talked about at the seminar. Um, I was there for the, the first the reflections transforming child welfare. It was a panel that included six people, two of whom were parents, one father and one mother. So that was encouraging. That that was uh, that was there were some uh, parents on that panel. Um, also, the uh, the video about the Logan, the, working uh, with Logan, they are actually starting a program, uh, some kind of initiative or program with Logan and visiting women. So um, the person who's in charge of QPI uh, that Diane referenced is also involved in the Logan initiative. And they were asking also to expand that to Cook County Jail, so there might be some, there's movement. And that was somewhat encouraging because we still have judges that won't allow any visits for incarcerated parents. So because, not because of the facts of the case, but just because of the fact that they're in jail. So to have DCFS to be able to come in here and feel like they can say, no, we're actually encouraging this, this is good as witnesses, if we can get that message to the, the people that would be, the people on the ground, that would be great. Um, the director of the Department of Corrections also seemed very interested in working with parent attorneys. He gave, um, I, so he, we're gonna be in communication about how we can get visits for our clients and what's available and hopefully we can share that uh, hopefully I'll get that to share with the parent attorney network. Um, QPI, Quality Parenting Initiative, the, again, the, I thought the, um, the focus of QPI in the presentation was very much directed at uh, foster parents. Um, I've been involved with that initiative since its inception in Chicago. The um, Children's Home and Aid and other uh, Children's Home and Aid is taking this on. Um, it seemed to be asked by the director and Carol to take this on to see if it would work in an agency and then spread it all over the um, really the state. Um, but so that started off with a group of people from Chaffee getting together. They actually reached out to me to participate in it. Um, so I think the presentation doesn't really, didn't really do justice to what is, excuse me, actually happening. Uh, but, but what is, um, and we are struggling to get uh, parent advocates and parent attorney voices on there. So if anybody wants to volunteer for that, I could probably get people in there. I was very turned off when they first came to me and I would have been very turned off if I just listened to the presentation. But really what they are, tr what Children's Home and Aid is doing is trying to rebrand themselves. They're having and rebrand what they say to foster parents uh, when they call in our prospective foster parents. The, even the licensing representatives there acknowledge that with young babies, people are just in it to adopt and um, that 
it's very hard to get them to focus on reunification first and, and also with other kids. So what they are doing is they're rebranding and the first um, part of their rebranding statement talks about partnering with parents. Um, so, so, so it's, it's, it's another positive thing I think that the department is doing, but could be very negative if we don't insert ourselves into that and really be involved with what's going on. They, um, so they want to be able to call, when foster parents call up, they want to be able to tell them what they are and they want to be able to set the expectation from the beginning that foster parents will work with parents. Um, so that's, that was really what that was about. So again, a, a, another invitation to see if there are those who can stomach some of this at first to be able to try to see if they'll listen to what we have to say. Um, in moving that initiative forward because it is an initiative that Carol has the director's ear, definitely, Carol uh, Schaefer. And so, and she is very, very interested in parent perspective. They actually asked me to go to a national convention on QPI because it's all over the country. There's a website you can look at um, with them and she's really looking to have more parent involvement in what they're doing. Uh, Jessica, I'm really interested in this, so I might reach out to her because I do know her from way back, and I I, I might uh, like take her up on that. Yeah, and and they also so if we could get parents as well too. Yes, that would yes. Be I'm, because I'm interested. I'm I'm interested. I'll contact you after this uh after this webinar. Okay, that sounds great. So uh, let's. Jessica, were there other sessions you wanted to comment on? Because I think we want to move on to some commentary about um, the issue of domestic violence and some of the other issues. That, no, you know, I'm okay. Topic. Okay, good. So let me turn. Um, I just want well, to. Diane, I just do want to acknowledge for people there that there was. I don't. I don't know if anybody went to it, but there was a session on. Uh, they called it "Birth Parents Changing Our System to Protect Our Children in Illinois." I didn't go to it, but. Um, and so I don't know how it was at all, but I mean, it, was, it was at the same time as Diane's safety plan uh, meeting. So I was in Diane's safety plan workshop, so I didn't get to go to that. Okay. So what, what I'd like to do is turn it over to Sarah Block um, and mention that I did see some improvement in the in the strategic plan by including mention of domestic violence advocates and also also mentioning Norman in a way that they hadn't, um, you know, mentioned in the first draft. So so that's a move in the right direction, but um, there's a lot of room to, to go further. So, Sarah, do you want to talk about what you're working on and, and the whole issue of how you see that fitting with the strategic plan? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so um, some of you may be aware that about a year ago we formed something called the Domestic Violence Child Welfare Resource Coalition. And it was an effort, it's an effort to help translate um, the model policy of Allegation 60 regarding environment injurious into effective practice. And we were trying to approach this somewhat collaboratively with the department um, in thinking about taking Director Sheldon up on his offer about bringing in the community voice. He does, he does a lot about having to rely upon the community to say what the issues are and what the possible solutions are. Um, and so we took him up on that, that invitation and formed this coalition of over 30 domestic violence advocate agencies and service providers. Um, it is um, the Better Women's Network is a part of it and is a co-director with me, as well as the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court judges, and we have the support of the Illinois Coalition Against Domestic Violence also. So we formed this coalition to be a strong, unified voice to DCFS to say regarding domestic violence, here are the problems we're seeing and here are the solutions that we're proposing. Um, so over the past year, we have involved ourselves in um, opportunities to interact with the department in, in the transformation process, and it culminated in um, two meetings in September in which we met with Director Sheldon and Pete D. Gray, um, who's in charge of the merchant sites, as well as um, Director Sheldon's chief of staff. And we also had a meeting with um, about eight um, people within DCFS, Nora harms -Wodelsky, um, Misha Patel, other people who are in charge of areas of DCFS that interact with domestic violence. 
Um, and both these meetings were the result of a position letter that we submitted to the director um, outlining what we are asking for. Um, and I'm happy to report that the director and DCFS are entertaining all of our requests. Um, and we have pilot meetings in November and December to further to, to further um, discuss these possibilities. So, the, and all of our asks that we're asking for coincide with um, goals outlined in the transformation um, plan. So, the the culminating ask is that we are asking for a pilot project in which we co-locate domestic violence advocates into investigative units at DCFS. Um, this is a model that's used in a variety of places and very effectively across the state, across the country, um, specifically in Florida. Um, Florida has a statewide co-location project in partnership with their Florida Coalition and Domestic Violence that's extremely effective. Um, P.T. Gray was, was very integral in doing that in Florida, so at the meeting he was very happy to hear that this was one of our, um, one of our solutions to the problems that we're seeing. Um, and so that is that coincides with the goal six of the transformation project or plan, which says to build relationships and effective community communications um, internally and externally by engaging, engaging youth and their families. So everything else that we've asked for stems from this idea of what, what would make it an, an effective pilot project for co-location. Um, we are asking DCSS to, to track domestic violence cases both directly under environment injurious and regarding other allegations. Um, again, that's consistent with their goal five of um, data collection and predictive analytics and things like that. Um, we are asking for more instructive procedures and policy guides for allegation 60. Um, that's consistent with, with goal three of quality and outcomes. Um, we're asking for a training for investigators and caseworkers based upon um, a safety together model, which is a which is a well a well researched model for child welfare um, training on domestic violence, and that's goal one: education and self sufficiency. Um, and then we're asking DCFS to examine the effectiveness and the role that the domestic violence intervention program currently plays and could play. Um, and so all of these things, as I said, are consistent with um, the department's priority or stated rhetorical priorities of being strength-based, being trauma-informed, um, being family-focused, um, and using outcomes as well as best practice and the community voice. Um, we're hoping that we can see some very positive changes in the way that DCFS responds to families experiencing domestic violence. Our unifying mantra that we that we our position is well, what is an effective intervention? That's what we're asking for. And an effective DCFS intervention would strengthen rather than weaken the non-offending parent's ability to parent her children in safety and stability. Um, and it seems that that is sort of a, a place that we can find common ground. Um, and we're hopeful that we will continue moving forward on all of these things. It was clear that the director um, told the people who we met with at DCFS in a separate meeting to listen to us, to collaborate, to work together. Um, and in our meeting with him, he was extremely receptive to our, our discussion. And at the summit, I was able to have a conversation with him at the, tech, at the strikeout session on technology, um, in which I was able to, I took a lot of weight. I, took, I, lear I learned a lot um, about in the, in the session regarding um, evaluation that we're going to work on in the next month or so. So in, a, in our next meeting, we will have a theory of change model for co-location, I think he will find very persuasive um, and will be very instructive. So um, we have some strong movement and we're hopeful that um, that we can make continue to make headway on these on these issues. Um, there are some potential funding opportunities that would become available um, with through a true partnership with our coalition in DCFS. And so those are on our radar screen um, to help fund this pilot project and the and the um, accompanying request. So that's an update on, domestic, on where we stand on um, translating domestic violence into effective, pra in, into, a, into effective practice. Oh, I'd like at this point to ask Colleen Daly to talk about um, what she has observed about um, the focus on family-centered services, positives, and um, things that could be beefed up in this um, strategic plan. So Colleen? Hi, how are you? Good. Good. I'm sorry. I, I wish I could have been at the summit. It sounds like it was so incredibly interesting. And I, just a quick side note, the, the point about 
notification at ACRs and child and family team meetings, I see the need for that incredibly, uh, that's incredibly important because of all, I have a lot of cases over at juvenile court and we, and I know the public defenders get very frustrated that we're not notified about that. And our clients don't always tell us about those things because they don't know, you know, that we're supposed to be there. So I really do hope that that happens because we can really advocate so much for our clients at those. And I think a lot of things get done and we can really help our clients by being there. So I'm very happy to hear that. Um, but anyway, I, I had an opportunity, even though I was unable to be at the, can you guys hear me okay? We can. Okay, hold on, let me put my volume up a little more. Um, I, I, even though I was unable to be there, I did go through strategic plan and I know everybody um, has a copy of it, but there's a couple things just that stood out to me and if anyone, when I'm done, who is present, um, can add to anything or um, expand on anything, that would be great. One of the things I noticed, and it's on page 14, I think maybe I'll just give you guys the pages I kind of noticed, um, where they talked about intact families and expanding um, the intact family program and to better pursue geographical dis distribution of available services since many areas are underserved and they want to improve the quality and effectiveness of the services. Um, and hopefully, I, I, it indicated that um, that they, you know, really want to focus and the services they want to focus on are expanded services to help treat substance abuse disorders, expanded opportunities for supported housing and supported employment and additional respite services that families can utilize to help address stressful and overwhelming situations without requiring that their child come into DCFS care. And obviously as a parent attorney and someone who often represents parents in the investigative stages, our goal is to keep these families out of DCFS or out of the child protection system in juvenile court if we can and hopefully um, an increase in the intact family program will really occur. Does anyone who attended the seminar, did they really go into that that much at the seminar or at the at the summit? I think, oh, go ahead, Diane. Go ahead, you were there for both days and I wasn't, so why don't you answer, yes. So I, I think there were, there were definitely words about strengthening families and, and and even keeping families intact. Um, I think some of that was said in the, uh, when the people from the different, um, some of it was communicated, if I'm not missing it, when the Department of Corrections was up there the and the other human service departments heads from the various agencies in Illinois were there. But I didn't hear, I didn't hear specifically anything about that point, but I did hear some kind of family keep families together rhetoric. And and so they expand further on it and, and I everyone has the seminar and they are the the brochure, um, the strategic plan actually. Page seventeen um, is another thing that I noticed. It's part of their goal four prevention and population health and indicates that they want to ensure families have access to community-based resources and services to support and strengthen families and prevent the need for DCFS in involvement. And again, they talked about um, identifying communities with high rates of DCFS involvement and limited access to high quality health care, child care, early intervention services, parent education, substance abuse and mental health services, employment and employment training um, and also talked about um, encouraging um, have agencies encourage participation which I like of birth parent or parent of origin youth and foster parent and advisory councils and that they um, it seems like from what I'm reading 
um, that they want to hit these things at the front end. And I know that many of us, that's our goal too. So hopefully that will come into fruition. One of the things they also mentioned under goal four, and that's on page 18, is to enhance relationships with domestic violence advocates to improve the supports that family receives. And that over in my experience, any case that I've had over at juvenile court um, where DV is an issue, it seems like these a lot of these DV cases seems to linger in the court system for a long period of time. And I don't know why. Um, and maybe because it's a service that a lot of the providers are swamped and they don't have enough counselors or whatnot, but they really seem to linger. DV, 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 you hear it over and over, you know, from the state's attorneys and the GALs, and it would be nice if um, these DV services um, are hit more on the front end or early on in the case. Um, I don't know if they talked at all about DV, at the summit and those type of services, but I know many of us have cases, at least also in the investigative phase, where DV is alleged. Um, so if that came up at all at the summit. And the comment, another, we're getting a comment about the DV protocol it takes six months, and I think maybe the DV test group that Sarah is involved in should be, you know, looking at the 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 kind of rote requirements that are in place or in practice that are causing delays. That's great. Um, there was one of the, so one to answer at the at the summit. Um, what I and I can't remember which sessions there was some emphasis on using community-based services. Um, and one of the points that I touched upon with the director when I was also telling him about the lack of parent involvement. Uh, or real, you know, involvement in this in this summit and in this transformation team. One of the things I mentioned was that um, they have to be aware that when they're talking about using community services, lots of times when we do that, um, that won't count against their service plan here. So that you know, the caseworker will say, "Oh, it's not from our agency. We're not doing that." So I think it, going forward with the DV and everything, there, there has to be some real communication about. Um, about making sure when this message is being sent about using community-based services that it's not going to be a waste of the parent's time in terms of checking off the boxes they need to check off. So, um, Colleen, I don't want to cut you off. Uh, we only have uh, about a little more than 10 minutes left. So um, anything else you wanted to highlight? And then I wanted to move on extremely Two very, very quick points. Yeah. Um, it does seem that, you know, throughout it they do talk about, you know, with foster parents, getting them more engaged in, in support as well. There is a, seems to be a focus on services for foster parents. And then one thing I really did like, and they mentioned on page 19, is they did say that the plan of care will recommend a robust array of services that are uniquely designed to meet the individual needs of a child, a family, and serve the goal of um, expeditious reunification. So, um, doesn't see, so you know, it does seem that that theme ran through um, about having more services, hopefully more front end services, and to reunify families quicker. So, that's those are just the comments I wanted to make, Diane, um, on what I saw in the. Um, so let me very briefly talk about. Oh, my, hold on, we need your tennis shoe. I'm sorry. For what? I have it in my thing. I have it. Yeah. Um, let me let me mention a couple issues that came up at the safety plan uh, workshop um, in terms of the tighter re standards for re for removal, the elimination of hospital holds. Um, this was it was almost entirely caseworkers, um, including ALJs, and uh, also ALJs were in my group, and some DCFS attorneys were in my group. And a lot of this was news to people. And I got the question from Meryl Paniak of how do investigators make decisions about whether they're prop there's probable cause. They don't know how to do that, right? They have really not been trained because now 
we are moving to a system where the standard for ever doing a safety plan is DCFS first has to decide they have probable cause and they are supposed to have immediate and urgent necessity or exigent circumstances at the point that they demand a safety plan or start to discuss a safety plan. And really, we do not have the training and the expertise and the knowledge base in the group of people who are called upon to make these decisions to actually do this. So there's a huge training need right there. I mean, a lot of, I did get a lot of positive responses. There was some baiting um, of uh, me in, during that session where, you know, I, they tried to position me as a parent advocate and not a child uh, safety, you know, to the exclusion of child safety. But I think there were a lot, of, there was a lot of recognition in that, in that group that safety plans were very problematic from DCFS perspective, that they went on way too long, that they didn't have tight standards, that they didn't, you know, really um, respect the parents' wishes, and they, that they are moving in a direction. Another interesting thing about the hospital holds, which are supposed to not occur, is that half the state knew about that and half the state did not. The North people from Northern region knew about it and had been discussing it and been processing it with hospitals to some extent, and the Southern region people didn't know anything about it. So this is sort of an uh, indication of how messages get communicated within the department and how training, you know, doesn't really necessarily happen and clear policies do not get communicated and so certainly we have to, you know, continue to advocate for them to, you know, really, you know, communicate with all their people and put stuff out on their web page and do all those kinds of basic things that, uh, that make these messages go through. But I think one thing we haven't maybe stressed about the summit is that the audience, I mean, the audience was really their own workforce. And I don't know how all these messages will really be received. I mean, there's some progressive things happening at the top, for sure. But how is this being received? Um, because in my session, we could see some pushback, for sure, you know, in terms of some of these directions that are joint directions with DCFS. Um, so let me, with that, turn it back to Jessica and then to Suzanne. Uh, to wrap up, Jessica, did you want to speak to um, the issues of legal representation, disproportionality, um, anything further on those topics that you were planning? Uh, sure. So there were, uh, there were some sessions that addressed uh, racial, racial equity and racial, there was one racial justice and judicial practices, and there was also another session, um, but I, I didn't, I didn't uh, race informed child welfare practice, better families, and institutional outcomes, but I didn't really see that mentioned in a lot of the other sessions. It was kind of like their own sessions, and it didn't filter through. But I will say that I um, Cook County, uh, as well as I think Cook South and Cook Central, uh, all. Each of those regions have what's called a transformation team that's been in existence since, our Cook has been in existence since about 2008. And the idea was that they came up with a strategic plan to address uh, racial equity issues and, and disproportionality. So that team has its own strategic plan. I, you know, I have some problems with that, but I hope to soon get help with that because Suzanne, I talked to the person who's got, um, her nomination letter to become a member, and there's another person from our office who is. But that um, that strategic plan was introduced to the director at the time, and then each director afterwards, it was also introduced to this director. The team had recommendations that they submitted to the director um, how to improve the strategic, the proposed strategic plan. And according to Bob Blackwell, who is the director of the Office of Racial Equity, uh, all those recommendations were accepted. I wasn't able to be involved in those. Some of those recommendations really had nothing, well, weren't so powerful, I don't think. But um, there were a couple recommendations, and I don't know if they got in the strategic plan, um, that they were talking about um, some of the recommendations were uh, include cultural competency training in the curriculum for foster parents, uh, relatives, and fictive kin, 
make efforts to ensure that youth stay in or near the, their home of origin to increase natural supports and uh, take steps to increase community involvement. Um, so the, some of those are the components that I hope got in the strategic plan. That, But again, this is a group that also um, has some influence with the director, so we hope to get more parent representation on that group as well. So that's all I have on that. Great. Um, I think we've talked some about the legal representation issues too, and I think that's a topic for us at IPAN to continue to discuss. To, to talk about at uh, in future meetings, how do how do we want to address this gaping hole? So let me turn it over to Suzanne, who's going to wrap up this very excellent uh, webinar. Thank you all, um, Suzanne. Can you give thank us you, a Danny. final remarks? Yes, just a few final remarks. Uh, thank you. Um, at, uh, I'm disappointed that that parents of origin were not even included into the strategic planning process until very late in the process. The, the, the draft that was issued earlier this year that was put on uh, DCFS's website and, and where they asked for public input, parents of origin were not included in the process that led up to that draft. And the reason why I mention that now, even though we have a an updated strategic plan issued at the summit this week is because that lost time, I think, plays a role and, and is a big factor in why this current strategic plan issued this week still falls short in the inclusion of parents of origin. Uh, in section one, it, it for for example, I have many examples, but I'll just mention a few. In section one. Um, it mentions the, the department's support of parents at training, such as parenting classes and life skill classes and the like. But it doesn't say whether the parents' uh, inclusion or attendance at those trainings will be enough to suffice in their, in their case, in getting their kids back and having their families reunified. In Section 2, it mentions that uh, minority families uh, it mentions about Safe Families for Children, a program that helps to keep uh, families intact, but I'm not sure how many minority families are served by that organization. I've met with the executive uh, director of that organization uh, several years ago, about three years ago, I think, and I asked him then how many minority families are served, and I didn't get a, a complete answer. So if if we're not serving minority families through that organization, I'm not sure how much help is going to be uh, systemically in, in reunification of families. In Section 3 of the Strategic Plan, it mentions about uh, expanding supportive housing options, but it, it leans heavily on youth and care, and, and, and I don't think not enough concrete meat about how are you going to translate uh, parents having supportive housing for their children. Section four uh, mentions about ensuring families has access have access to community-based services, but it doesn't say how they're going to do that. Uh, in goal five, I'm I, I'm just speechless about goal five in the strengthening family section of the strategic plan. It talks goal five is supposed to be about data integration and predictive analytics, but it 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 only says uh, we're going to train we're going to tell caseworkers to make better use of text and emails. We're going to make sure families have computers at treatment centers. And I think it it falls short of saying how data integration and predictive analytics will have a, a, will play a role in the reunification of families. Might this suggest that data integration and predictive analytics has little to do with strengthening families? I don't know. But I, I think uh, it's woefully short in that area. In six, in section six, it talks about the co-parenting and reinforcing the value of co-parenting. But it doesn't say we're going to mandate co-parenting. We're going to create a metric for agencies that co-parenting become a standard of operation. What they should be doing, at a minimum, is everywhere in the strengthening family section where it has the word evaluate change that word to do. There's too much mention in the plan about we're going to evaluate the need for this. We're going to evaluate whether something like this will work. Don't evaluate it 
these things, do these things. We need services. We need uh, help in, in, in strengthening families. And, and they're talking about it, but they're not walking it. Uh, in June of this year, Director Sheldon had asked me, uh, asked my organization, Families Organizing for Child Welfare Justice, to submit a recommendations letter to him about ways that DCFS can improve its services to parents. And, and uh, included in that recommendations letter, I recommended that parents of origin be included on all current statutory and non-statutory advisory committees. I don't see anything in the strategic plan uh, regarding that. I also uh, said in my recommendations letter that the director meet at least monthly with an independent advisory board of parents of origin. They have the uh, birth parent councils and, and that's nice, but I'm not sure because that uh, those councils are funded by DCFS and they're uh, supervised by DCFS personnel. I'm not sure how strong of a voice they can actually have. I'm recommending an independent advisory board of parents. Uh, this will take away any concerns about conflicts of interest and, and whose interests the advisory board represents. Uh, there needs to be a detailed project plan to show for the department to further show its commitment in actually implementing these recommendations in the strategic plan. It's one thing to have a plan and, and say uh, a nice to-do list, but when are you going to do these things and who is going to be held accountable if the things are not done by the date set? Uh, as executive director of FOCWJ, I, we do desire to be a partner with the department in the strategic planning process and implementing the uh, the ongoing uh, strategic plan recommendations. And I'm hoping that there just be a more inclusive voice of the parent in this process. And that's all for me today. And Suzanne, do you want to give a plug for your benefit on uh, October 27th? While Absolutely. We a second. I, I thank you so much. Uh, Families Organizing for Child Welfare Justice is having its first anniversary celebration and fundraiser event on Thursday, October 27th at 5.30 p.m. It will be held at the Little Black Pearl Art and Design Center located 1060-1060 East 47th Street in Chicago. Tickets are $50 each, and they can be purchased in a number of ways. If you go to our website, www.fo cwj.org and click on the yellow donate button at the top of any web page at that site, you will be taken to a page that gives instructions on how to purchase tickets or donate. And I'm hoping that everyone here who is listening today can do that. Thank you. So let me conclude by saying if you had questions, um, you can please email them to our listserv. Um, it is I, capital I-P-A-N, listserv at FamilyDefenseCenter.net. And please join that listserv if you haven't joined already. Brian will help you if you haven't joined. Yeah, I'll send an email out to the group um, listening now so you have instructions on how to join. So, so let me thank our panelists and thank Brian especially for doing all the tech support for this um, and for helping us with IPAN, generally speaking, and keeping us organized. So we have a, we have a lot of work to do. Obviously, I think that's one theme. We have a lot of work to do. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye.